people that work in analysis are very aware that they produce errors. People that use analytical data are, are aware of it as well. So I don't think there's any big surprises here. But there's a fear associated with the error, which is not appropriate. We can accomplish our objectives and do meaningful work in spite of the errors. That is the theme of this, of this exercise. The theme of this is to dispel some of the fear about errors in analytical chemistry. To encourage the fact that we can accomplish what it is we're trying to do in spite of the errors. To show that the errors are interesting in their own right. And there's all kinds of things we can learn about them. About our, our analysis, about how to report things out, about how to de determine de detection limits. There's all kinds of stuff that come out of error analysis. I think in order to start down this road, we've got to look at the analytical process itself. In order to do that, we need an example. I want to use ethyl alcohol. Ethyl alcohol is a common material in our society. It's used as a solvent. The context in which I want to use it is blood alcohol for forensic studies, like as a forensic analysis of drunken drivers. As Analytical chemists, we are technology people. We are trying to accomplish something. We don't care what ethanol looks like. Our concern is with its physical characteristics a little bit. Ethanol is, has a low boiling point, and it burns, which impacts on our chromatographic analysis, but we don't care what it looks like. We're trying to answer questions. This is not a philosophical like discussion. This is not like, you know, well, you know, no. We're trying to solve problems. We want to analyze for ethanol. There's two pieces of the puzzle that we need to discuss quickly right now. One of them is right here. This jar is 100 milligrams per deciliter ethanol. 100 milligrams per deciliter. That's weight to volume ethanol. This could have come from a purchase standard we could have made this up ourselves. The 100 milligrams per deciliter is a definition that we're using. It's important because we use milligrams per deciliter here. We're going to end up with milligrams per deciliter when we're done. To do an analysis, you have to make definitions and, and like kind of say, this is the way we're going to do this with the goal of what it is we're trying to do. 100 milligrams per deciliter. The units are arbitrary. Concentration, it's, it's, it, this is weight per volume. It could have been volume per volume. It could have been weight per weight. It could have been um, volume per weight. It's completely arbitrary how it's done. We want our results to come out in milligrams per deciliter. So we start with milligrams per deciliter. Second part of the puzzle, we take the solution we take 10 microliters, 10 microliters. It's um, a 10 millionths of a liter. So that's, um, if you put some on the end of your finger, you'd be able to see it, but it wouldn't be very much. There's a little syringe. It's a syringe. The bore of the syringe is about the size of a pencil lead. So it's not hard to measure this. You take your 10 microliters and you put it in an instrument and you sit back and you wait about 10 minutes and it gives you a number. The number it gives you will be the response to the ethanol. It doesn't have anything to do with the 10 microliters. It's only a response to the ethanol. We get a response. Let's say we get a response of around, we use 100, we have 100 micrograms per liter. We injected 10 microliters, and we got a response of about 11.4. Okay, so we get a response to the ethanol. We make an assumption. We assume that no ethanol is no response. 100 milligrams per deciliter will give us a response of 11.4, and we assume that there's a linear relationship. And the way this works is we say 0 is 0. Okay, we got 100. We're going to call this 11.4. We're going to make this point right here, and we're going to say that's our point. We're going to use that point for our calibration point. 
And we're going to make the assumption that all the values in between will, will match up on a one-to-one -one basis. Which is to say, there's a direct relationship between the response according to our instrumentation and the amount of ethanol in the sample. So, how do we know? We, nobody can see ethanol. You know, you can't really, it, it isn't like getting on a scale and saying I weigh 180 pounds or something like that. It isn't like that. You sort of take it on faith. We're looking at this graph, and we're saying 10 microliters into this will give us a linear response. How do we know this is true? The way we establish this to a very high degree of certainty is we use an external control sample. The external control sample is no different than this, except that it came from somewhere else. Somewhere else could be, I have a a jar that says 100% alcohol, 100% ethanol. I read the label. It says analytical grade ethanol, 100%. You know, maybe it still has the still has the seal on it or something. I use this something different, and I make a standard, and I make it up at 150, for example. I make it up at 150, and I say I want to check this standard against. The curve that I just made, because I want to know if this curve is really right. So I take the 150 samples, the 150 milligrams per deciliter sample that I just made. It's a control sample, something different. And I run it, and I get a, get a response of about 17.5. Um, I get a 17.5. It comes in on, on the line about right here. And it quantitates against the line, okay? So now the line is determining, the fact is now the line. Against this line, my 17.5 comes down, and I get a control value. I think it should be 150, and I get 148. So I look at the 148, I look at the 150, and I think that's a couple percent. That's pretty, that's pretty good. And I think that my analysis is done. The scenario for analysis can take a lot of different turns. But many, many of them are variations on what I've just given you. And a fairly large number of them are essentially identical. Zero is zero. One point determines the slope. The line that you're looking for, the calibration line, what you're concerned with is the slope. And you really only need one point. You've got your zero, zero for one of the points. And you only really need one other point. And then the slope of the line determines the response factor. And that's pretty much the nuts and bolts of analytical chemistry. Okay, let's see. The theme here really is error analysis. We want to look at the errors that are inherent in analysis. The key to the errors is through the controls. Where do the controls come from, Willie? On a daily routine basis, the technician runs controls. The control is a continuing confirmation that everything is okay. So they come, controls would be run maybe, a control might be run at least every day and probably more like every, you know, maybe even every hour depending on the analysis. They run, they run a lot. Very quickly, large numbers of numbers appear. We're going to be doing statistical analysis on this. And I am putting them into a bell curve because I want to emphasize, first of all, what a distribution curve is. And second of all, this is a statistics problem. That's what we're talking about. Statistical analysis of control, pro of control values. Um, there's a little bit of a misconception in the scenario I've drawn. The reality of analysis is that everything is done by the computer. The typical scenario is you set the samples up in a, in a in you put them in a specialized vial called an auto sampler vial, line them up, put them in the auto sampler, and then and then enter them into the computer as a list. So you put basically sample one, sample two, sample three, 
The standard will be labeled differently in the computer and treated differently in the computer. The control is like a sample. It, it's not treated differently than a sample. but It has a different label, but it's not treated differently. But the computer takes care of everything. An important aspect of the analysis is that everything has to be the same, especially the 10 microliters. We're putting 10 microliters in. The instrument doesn't see the 10 microliters. The instrument sees the ethanol. So if you're going to compare one to the other, the 10 microliters, doesn't matter how many microliters it is, but it has to be the same. The instrument takes care of that. It does a very nice job of injecting exactly the same amount. And I guess, I guess in, a, in a way, we don't, we don't really care what it is. Sources of errors in analysis Absolutely, every time you do anything, there's an error associated with it. Every time you pick up a pipette, um, every time you um, do anything, there's an error associated with it. One of the first things we do is we run a standard and establish the curve. Guess what? The curves don't come out the same every time. The curves should be very close. They should be very close, but they're, they don't come out perfect. So we can look at the curves and do our analysis based on the curves. You actually could do that. Um, I, the reality though is that the controls take into account all the errors everywhere. The pipetting errors and the measuring errors and the weighing errors, the errors in the curve, everything comes down to the controls. And in, in a very short time we end up with a very large number of controls and uh, we can do statistical analysis on them. Part of the fascination of analytical chemistry to me is that it's not a cut and dried, uh, this is the way it's done. Like a common technique in analysis and calibration is to do multiple points. So if you're going to do multiple points, you'll run like a 5, 50, 100, 200, and you'll end up with four points. The computer, and they're labeled, and as you put them in the computer, you label them 5, 50, you know, 20, 50, 100, 200, or whatever they are, and you label them special in the computer, and then the computer immediately turns around and makes them into the best line. This is another statistical tool called regression analysis. And um, it's all automated. You can be done, it can be done by 